Hello everybody, this is the College of Complexes. If you wandered in looking for apple pie, uh, you're also going to get Dennis Nelson uh, speaking on Earth Day and his concerns for uh, humanity and the Earth. Uh, we will uh, be uh, busy with uh, numerous concerns. All right, Dennis, it's all yours. Again, thanks for coming this evening. It's been a real crazy week with some things happening. One of the things that's been going on now for now 43 years is our Earth Day activities, things that are still going on that, that, that are important. Uh, with the extreme weather conditions we've seen over the past uh, calendar year, with extreme uh, droughts and heat waves and fires this past summer going into the fall, and with the flooding going on, the DuPage River, Chicago River, Salt Creek, all that, it, it all ties into what we're going to be talking about tonight. The original presentation title I gave Charlie was a special Earth Day presentation, my celebration for the 43rd anniversary of Earth Day. Again, Monday the 22nd is officially Earth Day. Today and tomorrow make up Earth Day weekend, and tomorrow is my official 43rd anniversary celebration, and we'll get into that when we come full circle at the end. In preparing my presentation, there are several basic themes that kept popping up. These things almost write themselves. These are the action alerts, uh, the messages, the, the comments that I submit online, and so forth. And these things basically write themselves. But there's always several basic themes that keep uh, coming up. Last year, it was a lot about the events surrounding the NATO protest. This year, uh, it just seemed that bad ideas that are defeated just keep coming back that we have to defeat again. And we've got three of them. We've got three bad ideas that keep coming back to haunt us that we have to keep pounding into the ground. Uh, another one is, what about the people? People are important, not just those affected by environmental problems, but also those of us working to solve those environmental problems. And in particular, uh, we look at the work of three women this evening. Here's the first bad idea that keeps coming up. It was defeated last year, but it's back, and we're going to get into the big one here. Please halt the Keystone XL or KXL tar sands pipeline for good. A climate catastrophe if there ever was one. My comments from scratch sent to the U.S. Department of State on Sunday, March 17th of this year. That happened to be also St. Patty's Day. Here I say, my name is Dennis Nelson. I get my residence. I am one of the original modern energy environmental conservation activists ever since around the first Earth Day, April 22, 1970, still going strong after almost 43 years later. I have a Bachelor of Science BS degree in Biology and Environmental Studies from Dana College, Blair, Nebraska. Putting it quite simply and bluntly, the Keystone XL, KXL, Tar Sands Pipeline is a climate catastrophe. The KXL is critical to enabling a rapid expansion of tar sand sintru production in the Canadian province of Alberta, and that will severely undermine our efforts to cut carbon pollution. In fact, the KXL will lock us into so great an increase in carbon emissions as to mean game over for our planetary climate system. Is Canadian tar sand sintru production in the KXL inevitable? No. Not if we say, no way. I hope that the White House officials are incorrect in indicating that President Barack Obama is actually inclined to approve this outrageous project. Please prove the over-optimistic Republicans in Congress wrong. Say no to the Keystone XL. On Friday, March 1st, uh, 2013, the U.S. State Department released a revised, yet still woefully inadequate, draft environmental impact statement of the Keystone XL Tar Sands Pipeline, which irresponsibly ignored the dire ecological impacts of building this unnecessary project. With the KXL, production of tar sands sin crude would more than double by 2025, resulting in a very sizable increase in our carbon emissions. Without the KXL, 
tar sand sin crude production is estimated to fall flat by 2020. Also, according to the U.S. Department of State, the KXL will directly create only around 3,900 temporary construction jobs. After completion, the pipe's operation will only support roughly 35 permanent and 15 temporary jobs with negligible social economic impacts. In fact, by contrast, energy efficiency, EE, and renewable energy, RE, are economic drivers for our century. According to a report by the American Solar Energy Society, the American EE and RE industries already create about 8.5 million green collar jobs nationwide. With effective policy decisions, this could increase to as many as 40 million of us by 2030. Already producing almost $1 trillion in revenue each year, our EE and RE industries could generate up to $4.5 trillion in actual revenue by 2030. Continuing on, rather than expanding such a carbon in emission intensive energy source, the Obama-Biden administration should be aggressively pursuing a carbon-free, nuclear-free energy pathway as the most technically and economically feasible way to get us off of all tar sand sin crude, along with coal synthetic oil and gas, oil shale sin fuel, offshore oil and gas drilling, public lands oil and gas exploitation, natural gas fracking and imported oil within 30 to 50 years an American highly energy efficient 100% renewable energy economy by 2040-2050. Carbon free, nuclear free will greatly enhance our national energy security, which the U.S. State Department should be keenly interested in, foster greater energy independence, create meaningful permanent and well-paying green collar employment already discussed, substantially reduce our overall carbon footprint that measures the impact of our activities on our environment in terms of the number of carbon emissions produced by using fossil fuels like tar sand sin crude and foster adaptive community energy resilience. We promote the fullest practical use of the best energy efficiency improvements for our residential, commercial, transportation, industrial, agricultural, and institutional governmental sectors. At the same time, we promote the increased deployment and implementation of a variety of well-designed, properly cited, and installed renewable energy technologies. We have local liquid biomass fuels, cellulose, cellulosic ethanol, and sustainable biodiesel using regional feedstocks, farm and community-based methane biogas co-digestion systems, solid biomass fuel electricity generation, wood chips or wood pellets with added combined heat and power, local community wind turbine and solar photovoltaic projects, passive solar space heating and cooling, solar water heating, solar drain drying, solar industrial process heat, higher temperature geothermal district heating systems, lower temperature ground source or geo exchange geothermal heat pumps for heating and cooling buildings, community-owned smaller-scale hydroelectric sites, and so forth. Happy St. Patrick's Day, Aaron Gobra. And I received a confirmation from the Department of State because uh, one of the questions in the past was, well, you do, Dennis, do you get any responses from all this stuff? And I do. I don't want to take the time to uh, read them all. This is uh, from Sunday, March 17th, the same day. Thank you for your comment. The U.S. State Department will review all the comments received on this site. Your participation in this process is appreciated, so on and so forth. Continuing on, support President Obama's second term agenda. Democrats.com, the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, signed on Monday, March 18th of this year with additional comments. And the petition is pretty well straightforward. I'm pledging my support for President Obama's second term agenda, creating jobs and growing the middle class, exacting comprehensive immigration reform, passing common sense gun safety laws. We can't let Republican radicals stand in the way of progress. It's time to create good middle class jobs and economic growth that improves the lives of every single American. Now a lot of that's not necessarily Earth Day related, but my comments are, and that's the good thing about things like this, when you have additional comments, then I take advantage of them. I talk about you know, my involvement around the first Earth Day, 
And then my recommendations for what the Obama-Biden administration should do are a synthesis between my own ideas and those of Dennis Hayes, head of the Bullock Foundation and one of the co-founders of the original Earth Day, along with the late uh, Gaylord Nelson, former U.S. Senator from Wisconsin and President of the Wilderness Society. To be remembered as a great president, Barack Obama must address the greatest issue of our time, human influence, climate disruption. Besides using his executive powers to stop or reverse the most dangerous climate-related practices, i.e. existing and planned coal-fired power plants, President Obama should commit the United States to a 30 to 50 year plan which would end our use of all coal and nuclear electricity, natural gas fracking, Canadian tar sands, sin crude, oil shell development, offshore deep water, Arctic Ocean drilling, public lands drilling, especially in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and imported oil, a carbon-free, nuclear-free energy pathway. I promote the HEW2 picks out of carbon-free, nuclear-free, so as a result, I'm not going to go into and read it because it's a list that's similar to what you already heard. So we're going to uh, move on to the second one. And our entire military should be deployed to tackle the energy security threat of human-caused climate disruption and even greater national security threat than terrorism. No part of our government is more energy intensive or on the other hand, actually more energy aware than the U.S. Armed Forces. U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, U.S. Air Force, and U.S. Marines. There's a tremendous interest in higher efficiency and more dispersed and distributed renewable resources throughout all of these branches of the U.S. Armed Forces. Each military facility should feature green-oriented living buildings covered with solar PV panels, solar photovoltaic panels, and tied together in smarter, hack-proof microelectricity grids. The U.S. Navy's low-earth-tech add-ons are stern flaps to reduce ship's drag and increase their fuel economy, higher-tech plug-ins like energy dashboards with Prius-type feedback on fuel use, energy savers such as LED lights, and simply turning off the needed lights. The U.S. Navy's wider-reaching green energy targets include, quote, awarding Navy and Marine Corps equipment contracts based on better fuel efficiency, deploying, not demonstrating, a great green fleet carrier strike group by 2016, phasing in hybrid fuel and electric vehicles to half petroleum use in the Navy's 50,000 commercial vehicle fleet by 2015, requiring that by 2020 each base, the Navy owns 2.2 million acres of land plus 65,000 buildings to be at least 50% self-powered by renewables like solar, wind, and wave energy, and ensuring that at least 50% of the Navy's total energy consumption comes from alternate sources by 2020. These changes will ripple out to the civilian world too, just as military demand propelled the development that eventually drove down the cost of American steel, radar, GPS, and microchips, unquote. And I put the pages down 19 to 20 to the article that I'm going to be citing coming up from Mother Jones. Our Navy's great green fleet is using a biofuel petrodiesel blend, a 50-50 blend of biofuel made from algae and waste cooking oil, and standard GP-5 shipboard aviation fuel. For further details, please see this illuminating article, Julia Witte, Full Green Ahead, Mother Jones, Volume 38, Number 2, March, April, 2013, pages 16 to 26. Please resist any and all efforts by the naysayers in Congress, U.S. Senators John McCain, Republican Arizona, and James Inhofe, Republican Oklahoma, come to mind first to cut back on these innovative green energy initiatives by the U.S. Armed Forces. For what it is worth, in a radio interview with Voice of Christian Youth America, U.S. Senator Inhofe argued that his belief, using that term loosely, that human-induced climate disruption is a hoax, is biblically inspired. Question, where does that leave? responsible ecological stewardship by more moderate evangelists who are taking their own actions to deal with our global climate crisis. Please support a statewide moratorium on fracking first and then a total ban. This is from Food and Water Watch. It was sent on uh, January 17th of this year. 
was sent to my um, state legislators. I urge you to protect our drinking water and public health by implementing a statewide moratorium on hydraulic fracturing or fracking in Illinois. And then this is when I personalized the message. The toxic results of using fracking, hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling to extract natural gas have led to the contamination of drinking water, cattle being quarantined, and dangerous explosions in states across the country, among other issues. As clearly and dramatically pointed out in the excellent do documentary film, Split Estate, the corporations using fracking own the underground resource rights and show a total disregard for the health, safety, and financial well-being of the landowners of the surface properties. These are ordinary citizens who just want to pursue the American dream. Please do not let Illinois become another home for the tragedies associated with this inherently dirty natural gas drilling practice. In order to protect our essential water resources and keep Illinoisans in the southern part of the land of Lincoln safe, we need an immediate statewide moratorium on fracking as a first step, followed by a total and permanent statewide ban on all fracking. Rather than natural gas fracking, along with coal and nuclear, our state needs to speed up the implementation of carbon-free, nuclear-free energy technologies promoting adaptive community energy resilience. And at this point, I mentioned a list of things specifically here in Illinois. And so uh, that's already been mentioned. If you want to go into some detail on other things, I can always read through this. But, you know, there's basically a variation of what you've already heard. Now, I sent another one. And that was from Environment Illinois. And this is please sponsor the moratorium on high volume fracking in Illinois sent to my state senator. And I'm not gonna read all of this because we've already had the one, but it basically talks about it SB 1418 to create a moratorium on high volume fracking in Illinois. And fracking could turn our forests and rural landscapes into industrial zones, releasing greenhouse gas, climate disruptive emissions and other pollutants, um, so on and so forth. Now, Citizens Utility Board had an interesting survey I participated in, Cub survey on Illinois fracking compromise legislation. The environmental community is split. Some favor a so-called compromise bill, and I think this has a real smell to it. I'm serious. I don't support the bill. It allows fracking, but with supposedly tougher regulations. And what we're advocating is actually it's a two-year ban. A two-year ban on all, all fracking here in Land of Lincoln. And of course, I advocate the, the permanent total, um, you know, the ban on it. So the two-year moratorium followed by the ban. And. Um, I, I'm opposed to the compromise bill because it doesn't go far enough to regulate fracking, and I included my comments about supporting the other bill. In fact, it's the uh, the one to my state senator that I just uh, you know alluded to. Now, the survey results that I got, I'm opposed to the compromise bill because it doesn't go far enough to regulate fracking. 41.8 percent. So we're ahead. That's the highest. So people, I think, are telling you know the cub that you know that this is the preferable bill is what we're talking about here. Here's our second bad idea that keeps uh, popping up, and it comes up in various forms. Radioactive metal mixing is always a bad idea whose time has permanently passed. Let's put it in the no nukes dumpster for good. Sent to the U.S. Department of Energy on Monday, uh, February 11th of this year. I introduced myself, my introduction regarding Earth Day, my college degree, okay. Currently I am the Vice President of the Chicago-based Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS, Nucle Illinois Nuclear Power Watchdog Group for more than 31 years now. In fact, it will be almost 32 years this year. With the pro-nuclear boosters have deliberately labeled radioactive waste metal recycling which has been pointed out by dedicated and informed activists like myself repeatedly, is actually a perversion of the ecologically sound concept of solid waste recycling, it is an inherently bad idea that seems to almost have a life of its own. As the older expression goes, it keeps rearing its ugly head, no matter how many times it is soundly trounced by the public's outcry. 
So as long as the pro-nuclear cheerleaders deep within the federal bureaucracy of the U.S. Department of Energy, USDOE, see fit to keep promoting completely cockeyed and extremely dangerous so-called radioactive waste metal recycling, I have the obligation to my generation and all future generations for speaking out in favor of real, inherently cleaner, safer, and truly sustainable comprehensive garbage recycling by again opposing this harebrained proposal. Continuing on, ionizing radiation protection regulations based upon the obsolete and unscientific reference man model permit radiation exposures under the law and regulations that have a disproportionate adverse effect on women and children. In the event of a maritime disaster, I've heard the older expression, women and children first when it comes to the lifeboats. But women and children first to be harmed by ionizing radiation, the inevitable uh, result of those federal bureaucratic regulations, come on now, how ridiculous. Therefore, the proposed mixing of radioactive metal from our nuclear weapons factories with cleaner and safer recycling metal and then put into our consumer products, pots, pans, silverware, jewelry, hip replacement, zippers, and so forth, will only add to the already harmful radioactive burden borne by our society, including women and children who are, guess what, the most at risk. For a nuclear-free future and healthier lifestyles, better quality of life, with no radioactive metal mixing. Here. And I received confirmation from the U.S. Department of Energy on the same day that um, that the uh, that the email had been received. Okay. Here we go with the third bad idea that keeps coming up. Code Red Alert, please keep the Illinois Nuclear Reactor Moratorium intact by opposing HB 3324. This was sent to my state senator and state representative on Sunday, April 14th of, of this year. Okay. Happy Earth Day, Earth Month. Before my late father, Robert A. Nelson, joined the top management team, of the Chicago Northwestern Railroads, now Union Pacific's real estate division. He owned a construction company and built one of the homes that our family lived in when I was a kid. There were two bathrooms, the main one upstairs and a smaller one downstairs. Obviously, my late father followed the common sense construction practice of not building a house without at least one uh, toilet. Unfortunately, this sort of down-to-earth common-sense thinking escapes the staunch pro-nuclear boosters. Here in the land of Lincoln, uh, sorry, here in nuclear Illinois, we have the dubious distinction of having more commercial nuclear power reactors than any other state, 14 total, 11 operating and three permanently closed down. Rather than being clean and green, the nuclear power failure, get it? It's a play on words. Nuclear power failure, and then the way that I have the quotes and everything, okay, is actually inherently dirty, polluting, and brown. One major reason why is that each nuclear reactor inevitably produces large quantities of extremely radiotoxic, high level waste, or in other words, irradiated fuel rods. Currently, there is no permanent, scientifically proven, technically, geologically feasible way of adequately safeguarding the high-level radioactive waste for the hundreds of thousands of years that are required. Therefore, the Illinois General Assembly passed a measure saying that no new commercial nuclear reactors can be built here in the land of Lincoln until the U.S. Department of Energy has an operational plan in place to manage the already mentioned high-level radioactive waste. It was a way of, to protect us from being a de facto radioactive waste dumping ground and to force the federal government to get its act together on managing this dangerous rad waste. However, the pro-nuclear cheerleaders have been defeated in their three previous attempts during the last five years to repeal, amend this portion of the Illinois Public Utilities Act that institutes our statewide nuclear reactor construction moratorium. Continuing on, this bad idea keeps coming back to plague us just like the radioactive monster in a B science fiction movie. This time, this terrible idea is coming in through the back door. HB 3324, sponsored by Illinois State Representative Mike 
Fortner, a physicist who teaches at Northern Illinois University and former mayor of West Chicago, calls for an amendment to the Illinois Public Utilities Act that would allow for research into small, non-commercial sized reactors of less than 160 megawatts in size. Ostensibly, these reactors would also consume a high level, or would, would consume our huge high level radioactive waste inventory in Illinois, now more than 8,000 tons of irradiated reactor fuel rods. In reality, this is a Trojan horse, whether by intention or accident. HB 3324 opens the door to the kinds of reactors that would rely on pyro processing to reprocess irradiated reactor fuel rods, which many policy and physics specialists agree would be a nuclear materials proliferation nightmare. It also has the potential to sabotage the Illinois Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard by introducing more nuclear generated power into a region already with a power surplus this would trigger an escape clause in the Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard that would allow electrical utilities not to meet their annual obligation to install new renewable generating power sources. And give credit where credit is due, this is included along with a fact sheet that was prepared by NEIS uh, Director uh, Dave, Dave Kraft. And I also mentioned that you know, I'm the Vice President of NEIS. Next is an emergency enforcement petition to revoke the operating licenses for GE Mark I and Mark II reactors in violation of safe operation and unreliable containment. This comes from our brother and sister group in Tacoma Park, Maryland, and the Washington, D.C. area group called Beyond Nuclear. It's sent to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, USNRC, was signed on Friday, April 12th of, of, of this year. There are 23 Mark I reactors that are basically the same identical design as the, uh, the GE boiling water reactors, the three which had total core meltdowns at uh, the Fukushima nuclear complex in Japan. We have four of them here in Illinois, uh, Dresden Units 1 and 2, and Quad Cities Units 1 and 2. Okay. We saved this from Corporate Accountability Project. It was done on Wednesday, March 13th of this year. They asked a question, a survey. What's your favorite national park? And it's Everglades National Park in South Florida. What's your favorite memory of that park? And I'll get to that in a minute. And this is about um, banning bottled water in all of our national parks. And that's what the reason is for this and everything that they received, they, they used in a press conference and release, and they were sent to the appropriate uh, national park uh, managers. Why should your favorite park go bottle water free? To save energy and natural resources, to cut down on park waste and litter, pretty well straightforward. And uh, here's what I typed in about the memory. Hi there, I'm a naturalist and environmental researcher, an experienced wildlife observer, an avid hiker, and an amateur photographer. Well, I've been to many of our national parks, Denali, Grand Canyon, Great Smoky Mountains, and uh, Rocky Mountain, uh, just to name some. My all-time favorite is Everglades National Park in South Florida. I was there twice with my late mother, Cleo A. Nelson, and I will focus upon our first Great Florida Everglades adventure, March of 1994. We hiked the Anhinga Trail, and I took picture-perfect postcard quality photos of the freshwater American alligators, and hingas, the namesake bird of the trail, double-crested cormorants, and so on, and the gumbo limbo trail through a hammock, where I shot a white-crowned pigeon eating berries. Joining the rest of the bird watchers and photographers, I took shots of beautiful wading birds, tricolored herons, great blue herons, little blue herons, great egrets, snowy egrets, reddish egrets, etc at the very popular Morassic Pond, as with Jurassic Park. At other locations, I photographed a tree snail, white color variation, a pig frog, an Everglades rat snake, non-poisonous, and a Florida cottonmouth, poisonous, and a boat trip in Florida Bay, 
We sighted and I shot an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin and our only American crocodile that exists in the brackish water. Besides having a topography of flat, flat, and more flat, Everglades National Park also has the distinction of being a unique flora haven for neotropical, subtropical, temperate, and desert vegetation, besides, unfortunately, exotic invasive plant species. This was most certainly an unforgettable trip. As a post-trip, I have supported a tougher Everglades restoration management plan, including eliminating all federal subsidies from the polluting sugar industry, and a stronger conservation plan to protect the critically endangered Florida panther. Now, some people have said, what good does all this do? This is an email that I received uh, from the Corporate Accountability International, Wednesday, April 3rd of this year. It, it's a follow-up. You got Coke's attention, and, and we did, because it uh, has in here um, the Golden Gate National Park in uh, San Francisco that they said that uh, they ultimately will not have any plastic water bottles in the park, and key parks are close to making the right choice, and so on and so forth, uh, like Mount Rainier National Park I've never been to in Washington. Um, Yosemite National Park in California, I also like to visit too, uh, because of one time by Sierra Club founder John Muir. And uh, they're looking at uh, banning the bottle. It seems that uh, the American Beverage Association, representing Coke and other beverage giants, has begun to publicly pressure Golden Gate National Recreation Area in, in San Francisco not to ban bottled water. So this is something continuing, but this shows that they're putting the counter pressure because of what you know people like myself around the country and the Corporate Accountability Project are doing. And I'm throwing this in for good measure, is I took the pledge to take back the tap. This is from Food and Water Watch, uh, April 3rd of this year. It's pretty straightforward. I pledge to choose tap water over bottled water whenever possible, fill a reusable bottle with tap water, support policies that promote clean, affordable tap water for all. I thank Jane of Lubchenco, the outgoing administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, for being an oceans advocate. This is from Environmental Defense Action Fund, set on February 7th of this year. And now we're going to start getting to the Rachel Carson stuff. I am in the midst of reading an excellent volume that was published on the 50th anniversary of Silent Spring. William Sauter on a farther shore, The Life and Legacy of Rachel Carson, New York, New York, Crown Publisher, September 2012, 496 pages, even before her seminal, eloquent, and substantiated attack upon very poisonous chemical pesticides like DDT, Rachel Carson, an aquatic biologist and information specialist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, was an award-winning author of The Sea Around Us, number one on the New York Times bestseller list, Under the Sea Wind and The Edge of the Sea. Generally like Rachel Carson, yet in your own specific way, you are also a champion and defender of the ocean realm. You and Rachel Carson are kindred spirits in your passions for the oceans. I'm expressing my gratitude for everything which you have done to protect our fisheries and promote ocean sustainability during your time as National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA Administrator. Thank you for your insistence that fishery management decisions be guided by sound science and data, not politics. Ours is the only nation in the world with such a broad-reaching management policy geared toward rebuilding fish stocks and ensuring their longer-term sustainability. Your leadership has led to a growing number of U.S. fisheries adopting cat shares allowing environmental and economic incentives while granting fishermen a guaranteed share of the catch for the first time. These programs are helping to restore depleted fish populations, substantially reduce the terrific amount of fish through bycatch, increase revenues for fishermen in fishing communities, 
and improve safety for an extremely dangerous profession. I also would like to mention your leadership on efforts to combat ocean acidification by monitoring and researching how it is impacting key species, a necessary first step in addressing this emerging threat to our oceans as a result of human-caused climate disruption. Again, thank you for your pioneering spirit and leadership in putting us firmly on the right course for protecting our oceans and maintaining American fisheries. For what it is worth, during my sophomore year at Dana College, Blair, Nebraska, in the Biology and Environmental Studies Department, I took a marine biology experimental class for my January interim. We visited the Oceanography Department at Texas A&M University, College Station, Texas, and went to the Gulf of Mexico, Padre Island National Seashore, and Aransas National Wildlife Refuge in Texas. This goes to Bayer, the global chemical company. Stop killing our honeybees. They market a class of chemical pesticides called neonicotinoids. That's a mouthful. Neonicotinoids, and they've been linked to the collapse of, of honeybee uh, colonies. And uh, the petition's pretty straightforward. It was sent on March 9th of this year from Roots Action. It's Bayer withdraw neonicotinoids from the market. And I, of course, included comments. This is when we get directly into Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Bayer, please stop killing honeybees, nature's extremely important pollinator, by immediately taking the very poisonous chemical pesticides called neonicotinoids off of the market. Then I go into the uh, introduction about me being an activist since around the first Earth Day. I do that a lot. I repeat, three-peat, four-peat, five-peat, that sort of thing. I mentioned my college degree. Uh, during my senior year, I did a presentation for environmental studies seminar about integrated pest management, biological pest control. Last year was the 50th anniversary of publishing the blockbuster Silent Spring by best-selling and award-winning author Rachel Carson, September of 1962, attacking very poisonous chemical pesticides, well, pesticides like organochlorides, chlorinated hydrocarbons like DDT, daldrin, chlordane, aldrin, and heptachlor, and organophosphates. Silent Spring reached number one on the New York Times best sellers list. Being an ecological classic in the same category as the Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich and the Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, Silent Springs sounded the alarm about what human-made chemical poisons were doing to environmental quality and public health. As a result, Rachel Carson was viciously attacked by those in the corporate governmental agribusiness complex who had a vested interest in maintaining the status quo about toxic chemical pesticides. The biggest misconception by our critics was, and by the way still is, is that Rachel Carson was against the use of all chemical pesticides per se. Not true. Silent Spring criticized their misuse and overuse, broadcast spraying. Rachel Carson advocated the selective use of safer pesticides which targeted specific areas and pests. The careful limited use of, some of, of certain chemical pesticides was sometimes justifiable in some circumstances involving the protection of public health, morally responsible. A special note at this point, any uses of the toxic chemical pesticides called neonicotinoids are never justifiable and always morally irrehensible. Continuing on over the years, Rachel Carson's carefully well-documented research thesis has been vindicated. Silent Spring warned about the potential for deadly peripheral damage or otherwise collateral damage to the balance of nature. Unfortunately, we have an excellent current example of this collateral damage in that neonicotinoids are wiping out honeybee colonies, and honeybees are way too important to lose because they have the extremely important ecological niche, role, or job of pollinating about 30% uh, of our agricultural crops and a whopping 80% of all wild plants. Introduced from Europe by early colonists, honeybees have largely displaced our native bumblebees and as a result 
have developed into ecologically indispensable workers. Every year, honeybees now pollinate about $10 billion worth of crops, from New York pumpkins to California almonds. Both feral colonies of honeybees and those maintained by beekeepers have been hit hard since the 1980s by the invasion of two deadly parasitic mites. As a result, there have been serious pollinator shortages in some farming regions. And that's from uh, Yvonne Baskin, The Work of Nature, How the Diversity of Life Sustains Us, brought a project of SCOPE, the Scientific Committee on Problems of the Environment, Washington, D.C., Island Press, 1998, paperback edition, 263 pages. The continued sale and use of neonicotinoids will put a double whammy on the populations of honeybees and indispensable pollinator. Also, please see this excellent volume for a thorough discussion about the work of Rachel Carson, and that's the William Soto book that I mentioned before. And I list it, so let's continue. Next is from Earth Justice, sent on December 18th, I mean December 18th of last year to our U.S. Senators Dick Durbin and Mark Kirk. Join Jessica Alba, demand congressional leadership and stronger protections from uh, toxic chemicals. I am joining noted actress Jessica Alba and the Safer Chemicals Healthy Families Coalition to put common sense limits on toxic chemicals. Americans like myself are tired of worrying about toxic chemicals and the products that we pur purchase and are turning to Congress for leadership on reforming an out-of-date federal law, the Toxic Substances Control Act, TSCA. Senator Lautenberg has introduced the Safe Chemicals Act of 2011, S. 847, and I urge you to co-sponsor this landmark legislation. The Safe Chemicals Act of 2011 would make sure that chemicals are safe before they end up in consumer products, increase access to basic health and safety information on chemicals, protect those who are most vulnerable, i.e. pregnant women and children. Actress Jessica Alba's announcement to advocate for America's family signals the concern that toxic chemicals in our homes and our bodies has become an urgent priority for people uh, from, our, from across our nation. As we begin to demand congressional leadership and tougher protections from toxic chemicals, where will you, where will you stand? I am requesting that you co-sponsor the Safe Chemicals Act of 2011 as 847. For what it is worth, because I am a television and film buff, Jessica Alba is one of my favorite actresses, having appeared in the hit TV series Dark Angel, Fox Network 2000-2002, and in movies such as Honey 2003, Into the Blue 2005, Sin City 2005, Good Luck Chuck 2007, The Eye 2008, and Machete 2010. Miss Alba also has a distinction of continually making the top 100 hottest women list by Maxim Magazine each year. However, I define hotness not just by in physical terms, but as a complete person. A physically attractive woman is hot if she also has talent and a passion and commitment for helping people on a particular issue or cause. In this case, Jessica Alba definitely fits the bill. We have one more thing, our human rights question. This is a petition from the care to petition site. Boy Scouts make including gay kids your national policy. And um, this is what the comments I included. What I participated in with great enthusiasm oh, was it was sent on Thursday, March 21st uh, of this year. What I participated in with great enthusiasm during the days of my youth was the Boy Scouts of America, which can be summed up for me as personal commitment, personal achievement, personal satisfaction, and personal improvement. Belonging to Troop 6 at Epworth United Methodist Church in Council Bluffs, Iowa, Trailblazer District in Iowa, Mid-American District, for Iowa and Nebraska, we had the distinction of having more Eagle Scouts than any other troop in the region. I received my Eagle Scout Award with two other Scouts on the evening of April 21st, 1970. Earlier that day, I participated in a pre-Earth Day rally in March, going from Thomas Jefferson T.J. High School in Council Bluffs, Iowa, uptown, 
picking up litter along the way to Baylor's Park near the Council Bluffs Public Library. Uh, that launched my involvement with the environmental uh, movement. Oh. I'm still going strong nearly 43 years later as one of the original modern environmental energy conservation resources population activists. Earth Day is officially April 22nd. My other scouting achievements include my bronze, gold, and silver palms for merit badges beyond the Eagle Scout, the God and Country Award, the Protestant Religious Award, the Gold Krill Award for Communications, the William T. Hornaday Conservation Award, Patch and Medal, and the Order of the Arrow Induction. Because the whole scouting experience has meant a great deal to me, this opportunity should be extended to all boys regardless of sexual orientation, sexual preference. This is a matter of human rights. Besides the Scout Oath, the Scout Law, the Scout Slogan, and the Scout Motto, the Boy Scouts of America should add the positive family societal values of tolerance and diversity, or in other words, it could be worded as acceptance of diversity. And that's it for the presentation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your patience, and uh, let's let the questions and answers begin. Don, you have a first lucky question. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Dennis, I, I was wondering, what do you think about this? Are you familiar with the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign? Yes, I am. Okay, what do you think about it? I think it's great. In fact, I applied for the um, Midwest coordinator. It was a three or four years back. Uh, in fact, I sent a letter in, for what it's worth, a cover letter, and I included my testimony that I included in favor of the mercury and air toxics rule. I mean, somebody else was hired. I don't have any problems with that, but I think it's a great. I think it's great. I've been a member of the Sierra Club for the most part since 1978, but very much supported. And do the emails and everything. And just unfortunately, I wasn't hired for the job. Okay. I still very greatly support it. Okay. Uh, I have a question myself. <clears throat> I understand that the uh, honeybee has displaced the humble bunny. Bumblebee, but uh, is now being displaced by the neo nicotinoids, uh, and uh, why would people spray or otherwise dispense uh, neo neonicotinoids? Yeah, no, it's a mouthful. I had to write it out. In fact, I phonetically put it on a separate sheet of paper to make sure that I had it pronounce it quickly, but I rehearsed it also more than a couple times, believe me. So what's it good for? Uh, it's, not, it's not good for anything, that's the whole point. That they, well, they why should, is it being, uh, uh, For profits, for Bayer is a large chemical company, well, and that's what the chemical why industry is doing. Paying for it? Well, when he wants to know, what is it they use? Is it a pesticide? Yeah, it's a pesticide. Oh, bed bugs. Yeah, it's a pesticide. Bed bugs? Well, it's not, good not specific as just to bumblebees. No, that's the collateral damage. It's not, they're not spraying it to kill the bumblebees. That's the whole point, that this is what Rachel Carson called the collateral damage, that you have pesticides such as you know, you can go through the class of, I mentioned the uh, chlorinated hydrocarbons and organophosphates. Again, uh, you know, DDT domestically has been banned, and it's like this is what happened to, for example, to, you know, bird populations like uh, robins in Madison, Wisconsin, other things that you saw a decrease in the populations. You have a, degree, a decrease also in the uh, it's a insecticide treadmill where then, um, stronger and stronger doses are needed. It's like the, the farmer is a junkie hooked on heroin. You, uh, you apply stronger and stronger uh, doses of pesticides and there's genetic resistance that develops in pest populations and therefore you're killing off wildlife species and also the natural enemy. So it's not a pesticide that sp their people are spraying to kill the honeybees. They're using it for other purposes and this is the unfortunate consequence of it. Carl, then David, then Liliana, and... That's a good question. I'm glad to clarify that. The other <laughs> group. How about... Carl. 
I really don't know, quite frankly, I just got that from like the resource book and I really haven't followed up on it, but that's, yeah. I mean, the book is more than a couple of years old. It's just the point, it's just one more thing that's, you know, going after, you know, uh, honeybee populations. Feral means wild, the wild colonies as well as um, the, uh, you know, the, the domesticated ones. Uh, Carl, what's the uh, status of this, uh, out in Nevada, they had this mountain that they hollowed out where they were... Yucca right? Mountain. Yucca Mountain. Yeah. What, what's it was the, killed uh, by, of course, it was killed by the Obama-Biden administration. Uh, NEIS uh, opposed it from the outset. Uh, it's just a bad site. It's... Uh, uh, hydrogeologically unsound, as again our director Dave Kraft says, you know, you know, don't put science, don't put politics before science. Do the sound science first, and we advocate what's called HOS, hardened on-site storage for all the irradiated uh, fuel rods. Leave them on site and arrange them, and maybe burn them, put them in hardened containers and burn them and space them irregularly so there may be or less to be seen by a terrorist attack rather than a centralized storage which would mean uh, potential uh, mobile Chernobyls and mobile Fukushima's by no transport, transporting this stuff all around the country. So leave it as it is right now and stop nuclear power. Stop generating more waste and, uh, and cancel Yucca Mountains for good. It's a bad idea. And that's, that's, that's another bad idea that kept coming up and coming up and, and the Obama people killed it hopefully for good. Okay, David? Uh, I think it's called uh, Yucca Mountains. Yeah, or Yucca. Yucca. Yeah, well, whatever. Sorry about that. When I'm giving the free material, gang, I know this is. I know the comedy club is over there. If you give me the free material, it is the College of Complexes. I usually run with it. You guys know me. I've been around. I do this about every year. So, well, be that as it may. So, my two questions first of all, neonicotina. The phrase got nicotine in No, it doesn't. That's just the name of the pesticide. I really don't know what's in it. It's just a class of very poisonous pesticide. It doesn't mean that nicotine is in it. Neonicotinoids. It's I, you know, I didn't come up with the name. I don't know anything really about the origin of the how the pesticide originated. I mean, I don't know if it was invented by Bayer, but they do manufacture it. But it doesn't have nicotine in it. That's a whole other issue. Is again, and I support. Uh, though I'm not preachy about. You know, I support no smoking stuff. I've never smoked and don't plan on it. I'll just, I thought I'd throw that in, since we're on the subject of nicotine. Secondly, whatever happened to Common Edison, Commonwealth Edison's plan, when they built the plant in Zion, for everybody, cheap electricity, they even had that little cartoon character, Little Bill. Little Bill. I wasn't here, but I've been told about it. It's just a little bill that used to be there. Spokesbird, and that's before my time, before I moved here. Well, it was a deregulated electricity marketplace, put the kibosh on Zion 1 and 2. It's closed down, and the reactor waste is there in the spent storage pools. So what happens to the cheap electricity? Well, that's the point. Just one of the broken promises of the nuclear power industry. Nuclear power, they said, was too cheap to meter. It's, you know... It's too bleak to meet, or it's it's too dangerous for them to do anything with. And you no, know, the, the so-called cheap electricity went down with uh, with deregulation. All right, Eliana, Eliana Weinberg. Uh, first, excuse my English, please. Excuse my English. I try to speak English. I enunciate okay. okay. from my, the diaphragm. My first, my remark. My remark. It's criminal. What they put pesticides on uh, honeybee. Because this is criminal. They cannot do pesticides on bee because bee, we need honeybee, right? Yeah. We need bee What's your question? My question is could any percentage come back, bee, and how many come back after? But she's asking a very good question. I really don't, of course, I don't have the answer to some question check out. The question is, again, after the spraying, after some point, 
uh, do the honeybees rebound? Yeah. If there's a colony that collapses, would would the colony rebound and by what percentage? And I, I honestly I honestly don't know. That's something interesting to, to emphasize. I don't put people off when I say that I don't know that I should check things out because I, I probably will at some point. But, uh, okay, I will go on Google. I will find out. Thank okay. you, thank you, David. David Thanks. Goldstein? Yeah. Uh, can you spell that, uh, the word N-O-N-I-C-O-T-I-N-O-I-D-S? N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-O-N-E-
okay. and it's caused, I'll have a little story about that, 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 that environmentalists won food, corporate agribusiness zero, I'll get to that in a minute, that goes back to uh, before I even moved here in the 70s as, as an activist. Now I support cellulosic eth ethanol and uh, enzymatic biodiesel, getting a little technical there, but I do not support corn. Now, I don't support, okay, great, I don't support food-based biofuels, whether it's corn ethanol or um, palm oil. That's a big part of carbon-free, nuclear-free. Arjun Makajani is a physicist and engineer. He put it together, and he's very specific in his report. Uh, I testified in the, in, as, in the, it was 19, the 1976, whatever, was during the Carter years, I testified at three public hearings in the scope of a week. The last one was before the Iowa Energy Policy Council and Council Plus Iowa on biofuels. And I basically talked about the sort of things that I'm talking about now, except information from Soft Energy Paths, which is a, a resource on using, for example, agricultural waste, that sort of thing, to create uh, biofuels. Somebody from the uh, Biofuels Association got up and uh, ripped up and down Lester Brown, who at the time was with World Watch Institute, now with Earth Policy Institute. The food versus fuel thing this guy mentioned specifically, it's been proven to be correct. Uh, corn ethanol has resulted in higher fuel, I mean higher food prices. So that's what I mean, environmentalists one, corporate agribusiness zero, you can say one and two when it comes to Rachel Carson Silent Spring. Well, I, I think we're we're in agreement on that particular uh, issue. Okay. Um, I, I misunderstood where you're coming from on that, and I, I wanted to make a point. It's my understanding that we actually use more petroleum to produce that ethanol. Well, that's my point. That's what the I mean by the energy ratio, the energy. I'm glad you clarified that. I kind of I just but, trying to answer a lot of stuff and get to the story. We'll back up. Yeah, that's the technical point that the, the energy ratio, the energy that you're getting out of it isn't worth it because of so much of the energy with petroleum that you're putting in to, to manufacture it. And that's what I was getting at. I think the one thing it does accomplish though is it rewards uh, farmers for the campaign that, That's why we have this program. Right, Archer Daniel Millen. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. He's answered all your questions. Yeah. Uh, Tim Bolger. Last year, last year, we had a gentleman by the name of John Coots from the Thorium Energy Alliance talk here. Uh, I'd like to uh, get your thoughts and what he what he thought about, and uh, if you had a chance to examine his uh, views. I'm not Kabbalah, but I anticipated that you know somebody, namely Tim, would ask about the thorium fuel cycle. Um, we are no nuke all the way. Uh, we've looked at it. We do not support any type of commercial nuclear fuel cycle. Um, to be honest with you, I'll be honest with you, that guy, was, that guy was very evasive, and I'll tell you why. The gentleman, I don't see him here. Uh, let me make sure. The gentleman with the degree in physics, I don't remember his name. He's a college regular. He was really asking all the right questions. I was kind of sitting there, you know, with the, uh, the cat, the Chersire smile is, because this guy was asking... He didn't know very much about it, and he goes, I have a degree in physics, and uh, wait a minute now, thorium is fertile, it's not fissionable, uh-huh, uh-huh, and you're going to need something in order to jumpstart, and you need, you know, like uranium-235 or plutonium, uh -huh, uh -huh, which can be used to make bombs, which uh, would, the thorium cycle will also uh, generate uh, waste. It has too many waste and proliferation problems, and so... Uh, there's some stuff on our website, uh, Dorian Brewer is our president and webmaster, www.neis.org, and I'll repeat that, www.neis.org. He's posted uh, two things that I recommended. One was from the um, Canadian Committee for Nuclear Responsibility. The other is something that, again, Arjun Makajani uh, um, he refers himself as effectively Dr. Egghead. He does the uh, Institute for Energy and Environmental Research in Tacoma Park, Maryland. He's a physicist and engineer. He's very much of a good critic of nuclear waste and this sort of thing. Uh, a fact sheet he did. And then there was a, a uh, NPR, National Public Radio debate, between uh, the, the guy who did Superfuel and Arjun. And really, Arjun raised the point where you keep hearing 
well, it's only 1% of the waste than what our reactors generate. 1%, who's saying that? What is the basis for that? You've got to start looking critically. We don't know what to do with our waste now. I'm talking about getting rid of nuclear power, generating zero radioactive waste. Can we really handle even 1% more or 45% more? That was Dr. Makajani's point. So no to thorium fuel okay. cycle. Where did you find it on, I'll get with that afterwards. I'm interested in hearing about the debate that was on NPR. But I, I'll, I'll Well, ask. basically what he did is that, um, at least he gave Arjun credit for the fact that he raised points. A lot of people just, oh, it's nuclear. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's bad, without any real reasons. I'm not putting down people that are critical of nuclear power, but I'm just saying you need to have, you be informed about it and look at some specific arguments. And what he credited Arjun for doing was, at least Arjun was raising specific issues regarding waste and proliferation rather than saying, Oh, I'm anti-nuclear. I prefer the words nuclear-free as in smoke-free myself. Uh, if you're against nuclear power, you're also for something else. But if you know, he said, at least you're providing some reasons why you oppose the fuel cycle, thorium fuel cycle, rather than just saying that you're anti-nuclear without really giving any specific reason. Thank you. Okay. How do you feel about wind power? Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's taking off actually, yeah, it's um, uh, cost competitive with uh, uh, coal and nuclear. I've supported the extension of the, re of the wind power um, production credit, uh, 1. 1.5 cents a kilowatt hour to help level the playing field between um, wind power and things like fossil fuels and nuclear. Um, as long as we are concerned and sensitive about siting, uh, there's a really good book out by the uh, president of the, the Conservation Law Foundation called Harvest the Wind. And he gives a very even-handed look at wind power. He believes in the potential, he supports it, but there needs to be a, a good siting. Look, Alamont Pass in California was not a good place to site windmills, uh, wind turbines, and you have to be uh, doing the you know specifics about keeping things out of, wind farms out of a uh, bird uh, migration routes, that sort of thing. There's also a big potential for offshore uh, wind power, even um, even here in Lake Michigan, one site like you know off uh, Evanston's being being looked at. But very definitely, not just, I'm not saying we just should do wind power, but we should do a variety of uh, renewable energy technologies. You also have to, you'll site wind, wind turbines at least a half a mile or so away from nearby houses because there have been uh, well, anecdotal stories of uh, you know of the noise of you know bothering people in various ways, and so these things you know we have to be you know concerned with birds and people, but very definitely the wind power is a source when we we properly cite it and everything that we should be using more of it. That's great. Yeah. Actually, in, in reference to what you were talking about with uh, the offshore wind project. What's uh, actually happening right now is, is, uh, is it's being looked across a, a multiple different sites up and down there. But there's a bill that is in the Senate uh, and has passed the House uh, for uh, giving the authority to the, the state to give permits and yeah. conduct uh, those kinds of, uh, of um, kind of analysis on on the migratory paths and the siting and everything. So the question is that I support, yeah, if you're asking if I support the bill, I do. In fact, I did an action alert from Oceana that's an ocean advocate group, and that's exactly what they, you know, of course I do my razzle-dazzle and tweaking, but yeah, I, I support that. I know what you're talking about is I sent the, the, the action alert to our U.S. representative, our U.S. senators, excuse me, but oh yes, yeah. Yes, uh, Gene Harper. Uh, you put in a huge amount of effort to write letters that have a lot of information and are well researched. Have you gotten responses from Senator Kirk or Senator uh, Durbin or the President or your U.S. Rep that are as uh, comprehensive and good as your letters? 
Well, I, I get <laughs> that's a very, very good question. I, and no, I like the way that it's worded. It's not just did I I caught. That's very good. I I gotten responses. I not from everything, but I have gotten like responses from uh, Dick Durbin on things, and uh, they actually well. Um, Durbin needs to be pushed. I think overall he's good. I think he's one of the best members in the Senate. But still, um, he does see a potential for, you know, so-called safe and clean nuclear power. And so he needs to be pushed. The responses maybe aren't as... Sometimes I just quickly sign a petition. Other times I use it as kind of a, basically a mini blog, my own mini blog de facto. Uh, the responses are just... A lot of them are, are probably generic, those that are sent out via email from like a staff person. So I would say that the responses for the most part are expected and they're typical, but they probably aren't as comprehensive as like you know, some of the stuff that I've been you know I've been saying here. As an advocate, you know, the, the tendency is to, you know, I like to embellish and then they're not going to be writing back maybe as long, detailed, and they'll they're going to be writing responses that are their you know from their from their staff people. But I do get responses. I've gotten responses actually more from Durbin than I have from from Mark Kurt and from Lipinski. Lipinski's my U.S. rep. Okay, Bob. Thank you. Yeah, definitely asking these questions about the, the Lake Michigan. What what can we do to prevent the Increase in concentration of the hexavalent chromium, which is not covered by EPA regulations, that uh, has to be uh, it's, it's higher than the standards uh, recommended by the California Water Authorities. What can we, can, can we also do to prevent the uh, Amicole BP facility in Whiting from discharging uh, the spent ammonia that they used to refine the Parsons fuel into Lake Michigan? They have a permit from the state of the Amicole to do that. Well, again, one thing is to you know, get active, uh, you know, come to the protest on Monday at the State of Illinois building, the Thompson Center, because the, because one of the, the literature does talk about the, the expansion of the, the whiting, um, the, uh, the refinery. In terms of the, the, the hexafluoride stuff, uh, I... Um, Hexavalent chlorine. Hexavalent chlorine. Uh, chromine. That's, I think that was from um, uh, the movie with uh, Julia Roberts, if I'm not mistaken. Aaron that was uh, Aaron, Aaron Brockovich. I think that that's that. Um, no, the chrome, uh, there's a there's a in the end that says a chromium chrome metal in the lake of Michigan. But the uh, algae or something that's hacked to make this water soluble is carcinogenic, and the concentration is much higher than recommended by the California Water. Okay, we've got a lot of major groups here that need to get on that and, uh, and uh, contact US EPA. I haven't seen any. Um, action alerts or anything, and uh, like the, we have the Natural Resources Defense Council here, NRDC, we've got Environmental Law and Policy Center, ELPC, which is Howard Murders <coughs> Group, we have the Sierra Club, we have Union of Concerned Scientists, and all these groups, um, you know, it could be, uh, you know, you know, could be doing something about that. We're overwhelmed with these environmental issues. Well, that's my these point. Are, these are two key ones, too. Yeah. Know, this is the best supply, fresh water supply in the world, and we're making it unusable by these discharges. Well, we need more public pressure, more activism and everything, but uh, we have the, the national groups. I'm just not depending upon national groups because, I mean, they send out stuff to, to, to me. We all have to get involved. We all have to get involved and do something. Right, uh, David Zucker? Yes, my two questions are, first of all, how realistic an alternative is solar power and two, as in the plain states, when, they, when the Ogallala Aquifer begins to run dry, uh, rumors are they're going to start casting an eye on the Great Lakes water supply. Uh, how can we prevent this and keep them from pirating our water? Yeah, that's a very good question. To oppose any kind of water privatization that has an issue that's directly connected to it. As far as, well, we need water conservation. We need to use the full practical use of the best ways of uh, conserving water, whether if it's through uh, low flush toilets, through uh, uh, sprinkling systems, through uh, irrigation systems that use less water, um, that, that sort of thing. One speaker here suggested a 
for uh, for that uh, purpose. Uh, to convey the waters of, of the Yukon and Mackenzie rivers. Uh, uh, can you speak louder so we can hear the question? What? Give him the microphone. The they also did. Water for the Ogallala. The plain states that rely on the Ogallala aquifer, which is most of about 20 years of water. The plain states of the southwest, uh, the waters of the Mackenzie and the Yukon were advocated as uh, a possible resource uh, for uh, these areas. Yeah. In your three, you're borrow you're borrowing from Peter to play to pay Paul. I mean, you're just like you're just continually. It's like we're using our you know resources, and again, beyond a certain point, you know, water becomes non-renewable if you take it out of the ground faster than it's replenished. So I want to answer the first part of your question about solar as well. Yes, that solar is very feasible. It's very practical. We have a lot of rooftops. Uh, the costs continue to, that comes down for solar photovoltaics uh, that convert sunlight directly to electricity to the point where it, it is in uh, North Carolina with uh, economic incentives that you've reached a cross point where cost per kilowatt hour now is competitive with like uh, fossil fuel and nuclear electricity. Other types of solar energy are practical. Solar domestic hot water heating is a proven technology that's been around uh, for years. My favorite technology is passive solar, uh, where the building structure collects and stores solar energy without the use of pumps and fans. Uh, uh, Dave Kraft and I participated in an event at uh, Chicago a Cultural Center. Uh, it was a, a film about the um, Maldives. In uh, Indian, in the Indian Ocean, the the island uh, country that uh, may become flooded if the sea levels rise too much. There was a guy there from uh, Downers Grove that you know lives in a passive solar house, and the uh, you know cut his uh, cut his natural gas bill so much that the gas people came out a couple times to check on him to see if there was anything wrong, and now they just leave him alone because he's okay. So solar energy is there, and we need we need to use it more, as long as it's uh, as long as it's cited correctly, and we need and we need you know, the incentives and the policies to do that. David What? What does he have as a backup when there is no sun? Well, solar, solar collectors are solar collectors that can work on uh, cold and cloudy days. And so if not, then you uh, get into your, your storage. Uh, Lithium-ion batteries are seen as uh, a potential for uh, electricity storage. Ultra-capacitors, uh, plug-in hybrids can be put into the electricity grid, and they could actually be used as a de facto storage. Um, you can combine a solar and wind system to create what's called a hybrid. Uh, the sun shines in the afternoon, let's say, whatever, and when the sun goes down at night, uh, many times the wind comes up and blows, and so and you've got the, the wind turbines uh, that are spinning, and, and you have that uh, you know, connected with some sort of a storage facility, but storage is going to be key to, uh, to making these things work, and also modernizing our grid to make it smart or smarter. We need, complete, we need to revitalize because we're, and it will pay for itself because we're losing too much money with transmission losses and everything. So different types of storage, uh, combinations of technologies, and uh, and they'll be tied into a, a part of a, of a smart energy uh, grid. Yep. Well, uh, yes, Ernie Norman. Yeah. Um, you know of a. Carlo Rubia and his work. Uh, he's a physicist, Nobel laureate physicist. He advocates natural gas is the best solution. Are you familiar with this work? No, I'm not familiar with the work, but I don't support natural gas as the best solution. It used to be viewed as an interim bridge between, for example, what we have now and a renewable energy future. Um, back in the uh, you know mid 70s, of course, 
uh, the Venerable Amory Lovins with Friends of the Earth. Now he's with Rocky Mountain Institute advocated fluidized bed combustion as an intermediate uh, transitional technology. But I mean, transitional technologies can have problems of themselves, particularly when you're looking at natural gas fracking. Uh, there's a report by the uh, International Energy Agency that basically says that that natural gas is a is really not a long term any long term solution to our energy uh, problem, and certainly is not a bridge to a renewable energy future. I'm not familiar particularly with that with the, the physicist that you mentioned, but I am familiar with the issue, and it's simply you know we simply don't need need natural gas in the long term. Oh, uh, I met Carlo Rubia yesterday. I will report on that discussion. Okay, fine. Yeah. Let's go to Rebels. Well, if that is uh, the end of our question period, we'll let them sit down and thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, how many people here have raised bottle comments to make? Uh, one, two, three. Sit down. Well, sit down over there, and we're going to arrange chairs. Eight, nine. Uh, well, 20 minutes each. I think five would be good. Till, uh, Maybe give them six. And we'll be here in time for breakfast, so 20 minutes each for a bottle, and then my response, that we'll be here when they open up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is, what can they say in 20 minutes? They can't say in five. I think the white staff will want to go home. Don't worry. Now everybody took me seriously. Go straight up on it. Turn the lights off. You should have been here tonight. You're a friend of mine. Conservation. You're alphabetic. Start to walk. Let's go. He's right about some of his ideas. Thank you, Dennis. Very, very good. Dennis never disappoints us. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, we have to understand the, the cycle of the Earth. For example, when we... When we get uh, heat from the sun, uh, the water evaporates and form clouds. The clouds rain on the plains or on the mountains as the snow. The snow accumulates, and as the seasons change, the water, the, the, the snow melts, and you have rivers coming down from the mountains. As the water, being the best solvent that we have ever found, it dissolves the minerals that they are in the mountains. And those minerals are the nutrients that they go to the sea and feed the corals, the fish, the crayfish, and all the animals that form the food uh, base of the, of the sea. Um, when we try to cultivate on a desert, which means an area where the rainfall is very, very low. Sometimes in some areas of the United States, it's 10 millimeters a year. Um, then if you want to cultivate in those areas, you have to use river water or aquifers. Of course, we are sucking up the aquifers faster than they replenish, and they are not forever, many of them have already been uh, brought so low that some people have to abandon farms. But when we use river water, what we're doing is bringing all those minerals into the land where we cultivate. Those minerals who are in suspension in the water eventually saturate the land where we are cultivating. And as you will find out soon enough, uh, parts of the California uh, productive land has been has been rent. It's, it's nice, Bram, that you uh, 
that you are uh, cultivating this conversation at the same time that somebody is speaking. Bram, what the hell are you doing? Well, how long you need to do to do that? God damn it. Just say your say. Say your say. So anyway, some parts of California have to be abandoned to produce food for, for, for us because they have high concentrations of selenium. Well, coming from that guy, what can you expect? Um, so um, some of the, the best lands that we have coming from California have to be abandoned because the food is picking up too much selenium, which becomes a poison. And so, in order to recover these lands, the smart people in there, they decide to cultivate cactuses, which preferentially absorb selenium. Now, what do you do with the cactuses when you have them loaded with selenium? We sell them to the Chinese. Now, that's not a bad thing because the Chinese have a deficit of selenium in their diet, so it works out fine. However, how long will it take to clean those lands from the selenium? Probably a hundred or two hundred years before we can restart using it as, as fruit, uh, plants for, for fruit or for vegetables or other things. So. We have to understand that the Earth cycle is much more complicated than we give them credit for. Next. Next. I'm Michael Foley. Yeah. No, I'm not kidding. No, I'm not kidding. I'm serious. In Boston, Last Monday in Boston, uh, last Monday in Boston, bombs were, bombs were detonated in the midst of a large crowd of people. Three people were killed, 170 were wounded. Every adult in this country, including me, whether we like it or not, we do this every day. We detonate bombs in a large crowd of people. We do it every day, and we have been doing it every day for at least 11 and a half years. We have been doing it in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Somalia, Yemen, Libya, Egypt, Syria, Israel, and Palestine. We might have detonated the bombs in Boston. We might have paid for the bombs and we might have paid the bombers. The whole operation might have been an FBI operation. Remember this. The first bombing of the World Trade Center occurred in 1993. That was done by the FBI. The FBI recruited people, hired them, trained them, paid them, furnished them with explosives, then sent them off to bomb the World Trade Center, and that is what they did. Another thing, in 2010, the FBI was involved in a plot to detonate a bomb near Wrigley Field. The FBI recruited a guy, they hired him, trained him, paid him, gave him a bomb, supervised him, and watched him put the bomb in a garbage can near Ridley Field. Fortunately, the bomb didn't go off. And another thing, last summer, the Chicago Police Department was involved in making Molotov cocktails. They were to be used during the NATO summit demonstrations. Chicago police officers were active participants in the purchase of gasoline and containers. The Chicago police officers were active participants in manufacturing Molotov cocktails and planning their use. Now I'm going to say something I've said before when I've been standing up here talking like this. I know how I sound. 
I sound like an insane friggin' lunatic. I know that's that. But everything I said here just now, except for except for what I said about the bombing in Boston, everything I said right now, we have been told by our government. Elected officials have told us that the FBI ran the whole operation to bomb the World Trade Center in 1993. Our elected officials have told us that this guy had put a bomb in a garbage can in Wrigley Field. He was working for the FBI. He was supervised by the FBI. The whole operation was run by the FBI. And the mayor and Chicago Police Department told us that Chicago police officers were involved in building Molotov cocktails and planning their use last summer. I'm not an insane lunatic. We are told all this by our government, and it's true. Anyway, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Was the uh, FBI... You know, the, the bombings, the, the potential bombing at Wrigley Field can be justified because maybe the FBI was upset about the Cubs not winning the pennant that year. <laughs> this ain't something to laugh about, you fucking chat off. <laughs> You're a fucking idiot, Tim, you know that? <laughs> Well, let me thank Dennis for giving a very comprehensive talk and celebrating Earth Day. He covered many topics and uh, he's very well informed on many of the issues. And I may have a few disagreements with him, but I, for the most part, support his uh, perspective and appreciate his dedication to resolving these climate and energy issues. Now, some of the things which concern me, I can talk about the time I had, the, the statement I made about uh, Shell planning to build a six billion dollar petrochemical uh, plant in Appalachia. You can check that online. I heard personally at the March meeting of the American, Chicago Section of American Chemical Society by the chairman of the board of the National uh, Organization of American Chemical Society and he was extolling hydro, uh, hydraulic fracking and mentioned that the, the uh, Shell will build the plant to uh, more or less uh, market the uh, fracked uh, methane there. Now I checked some online and there's a, uh, the uh, support for that project in Appalachian, Pennsylvania is simply overwhelming and mostly because of the unemployment in that area and they look for the jobs. Now Dennis mentioned very strongly the green jobs issue and that is certainly true, the facts are there. Uh, the Pew Institute has shown that the green jobs is the largest development of jobs and sustainable jobs in the country. But we're not getting through to the public on this issue. You know, a member of my own congregation in the state legislature supported the Sinfuels plants because allegedly of the jobs it would bring. And I was very ashamed that a member of my own congregation was uh, supporting that. But we haven't gotten through to people on the jobs issue uh, that is green. And I've been talking to the Sierra Club, which I remember, the Union Concerned Scientists, which I'm a member, that we have to uh, do more work on this issue to get through the American people on it. I think the Keystone Pipeline could be sold to President on the basis of the jobs issue, too. People were not getting through to the, on the green jobs, and that's a, something we have to work on very, very uh, much. Uh, the uh, other thing I want to mention, I was privileged yesterday to have an opportunity to hear uh, uh, Carlo, uh, I forget his last name, but uh, he's, he was the uh, high pro lecturer at Northwestern University. Carlo was the uh, Nobel Prize winner for his work on the uh, issues in high energy physics. And he gave three lectures at Northwestern, one on neutrinos, another on uh, some of the particle accelerators, and his passion now is on energy. His talk yesterday was the future of energy. Now you can go online to YouTube and essentially get his entire speech, and he gives this presentation all over the world. And uh, I checked it out yesterday, it was very much akin to what he talked about at Northwestern. Now, one of the issues which came up was, uh, he's very much for the renewable energy issues, but, he feels we need a transition. And the transition he suggested was uh, methane or natural gas. Now his proposal is to uh, extract the natural gas from the uh, Siberian region, the Arctic, and Alaska. 
but um, I happened to question him on the issue of what's going to happen uh, in the meantime when the permafrost is melting and we release all that methane into the atmosphere. That's one of the great fears along with the Keystone Pipeline. And uh, I did have a chance to talk with him personally afterwards at the reception, and uh, Professor Rubia uh, listened, but he did not uh, necessarily back down from his commitment to the uh, use of natural gas. He wants to take the natural gas and uh, the idea, instead of burning it directly with oxygen, he wants to uh, more or less break it down uh, catalytically into carbon and uh, hydrogen. What you're going to do with the uh, carbon, I don't know. Where are you going to store it? Now, the hydrogen he will take and build and make uh, methanol, and he'll burn that. Uh, this he, he sees as a transition between the uh, uh, what we're now doing with coal and with the going to renewables. The, the renewables that Dennis mentioned, he's all for it, but he feels we need a transition. Now, on the issue of uh, nuclear fission, he's been a very strong, uh, what Tim is for, for the issue of thorium. But here's what he said as a disclaimer on nuclear fission yesterday afternoon. We're running out of uh, fissionable material and it's only a limit and, and we can't rely on that. But I will admit, and I don't agree with him on this issue, he's very much for that thorium thing and uh, maybe that will boost your Tim's ego a little bit. He is very much in favor of that. But he, he sees it as a limitation. So that's what I heard from Carlo Rubia and I was privileged to be in his presence and uh, I'm, he came up to me and gave me his, he was speaking directly in front of me, closer than his microphone when he responded to my thing about the permafrost. He said he didn't realize that. Uh, the final thing I want to mention briefly is a talk we had at the American Chemical Society on, uh, a couple of nights ago about the, uh, and the director of the Richard Luger Center for Renewable Energy at Purdue, uh, Indiana University in Indianapolis. Uh, I think his name is Dr. Schroer, I'm not sure, but you can go to the website. And he has a lot of patents. He mentioned something I didn't realize, that uh, the refi uh, manufacturing of the, uh, so of the photovoltaics, there's a lot of pollution. Now, he has a patent to go to the moon and manufacture these on the moon, and he's deadly serious about this. How are we going to survive on the moon? He talks about the silicon dioxide in the crust, and extracting the oxygen there and building these plants and then bringing the photovoltaics back to Earth. Now, I have an offer for him. He sent me an email. He wants me to send him my email. Hope maybe I could get a position with him working on the renewable energy. But I was very impressed with him. Uh, you can go to the website of the Chicago Section of American Chemical Society and look for our, under our April meeting and if you want to learn more about his background. He has many patents working with NASA. He believes that the solar energy we can uh, more or less uh, focus it from the sun onto Earth and possibly bypass the photovoltaics. I didn't realize the pollution involved with the production of the photovoltaics, and he's deeply concerned. He thinks he also believes we have to get more platinum and we'll go to and mine some asteroids. He has patents that uh, to do that, and he thinks this is a very viable commercial product and will help us out. So there are very positive things there. Uh, the, uh, the, the, one, the only disclaimer I might have with Dennis briefly is that I, I think we have to be very careful using our words nuclear. I think we have to use the term nuclear fission. I oppose for what David Kraft and what Dennis does, nuclear uh, fission. I don't agree with that, but I think we have to do research on controlled nuclear fusion, the process that powers stars. And this is a long-term thing for the future, but we have to work on that and do research while we continue to bring online the renewables and I think it's a wonderful idea to phase out the subsidies for the fossil fuels and put them into work in building the Manhattan Project. Then as Dennis said, we can work with China to bring online more renewables there. We have to show the world way. I agree with Dennis that the way we're going to get China on board is to show that we're doing it ourselves here too. So, uh, Dennis, thanks for that. Um, I wanted to expand upon this on some of the more, uh, you know, interesting, uh, um, more appealing kind of things that we're, we're seeing, like uh, we're seeing um, the uh, wind energy developments in, in Illinois have actually been really amazing. Uh, 
we, we have a lot of that going on. And there's some things that you can do to get involved with that in terms of uh, we have um, the production tax credit is going on this year. Um, and the, it's, it's actually structured in a way that really makes this year really key. I won't get into the details. If you, if you want them, you can talk to me. Um, but Illinois has a law, a renewable portfolio standard. And because of a lot of the communities throughout Illinois, through deregulation, switching over to uh, alternative electric suppliers, uh, it's not being funded anymore uh, because of the way that law was written. And so there is a fix that is in the, uh, in the Illinois House right now that would make sure that that money goes to the uh, purchase of wind power, long-term wind power agreements. And this would keep the Illinois wind energy uh, industry going uh, at full strength. And that would create jobs, power, and, and you know make this transition go quicker. Um, so that's a really important thing for Illinois to be doing right now. And it's a really encouraging thing in terms of we can actually create a solution uh, that will force these problems Childs out of uh, uh, their space. Um, another thing I was mentioning earlier is there's an offshore wind bill. Um, this is not to actually cite a project at the moment. It's for continued research and for setting up the regulatory framework so that when a company comes interested in a certain site that uh, the state has the authority to give that, a clear authority. Uh, so that has actually passed the, the Illinois House and is in the Senate right now. Um, and um, those are the, the two very interesting things in terms of encouraging a transition yeah. here. And if you're interested in more of this, there's the Sierra Club's Air and Energy Committee is always working on these kinds of things. So you can talk to me about that. Or, uh, or if you want to work on it on your own, you can talk to me anyhow. <laughs> Yeah, a couple of uh, quick points to, to uh, amplify Bob's com comments on Carlo uh, Rubia's lecture yesterday. Uh, he is, in fact, in favor of renewables, but he pointed out one of the problems is the great sources of renewable energy, such as solar, the Sahara Desert, and wind, uh, over, largely over the oceans, are not close to the consumers of electricity and electricity doesn't travel well. Until we get to develop better technology and superconductivity, it's going to be a little hard to take advantage of that. He did not seem to have a, a lot of uh, uh, moral obligation or moral objection, shall we say, to nuclear, but he pointed out that only 6% of the world's power today comes from nuclear, so it's probably not really going to solve the worldwide energy crisis. And one of the biggest points he makes, he's very concerned, as we all should be, about CO2 output and the amount of CO2 that's going into the atmosphere. And with regard to national, uh, to the, uh, uh, to, to solving the problem in natural gas, uh, as Bob pointed out, he's uh, in the process of developing a process with his cohorts uh, which will, in, in, in essence, release the energy without releasing CO2. Instead, I believe, hydrogen and carbon directly, right? Yeah. So that, anyway, this is uh, some, uh, a man who's obviously knowledgeable and we should follow him. With regard to Dennis's talk, very good, as always. Uh, Dennis obviously has done a lot of research and knows the, the field very well and knows the issues very well. However, I will say I think two of the primary solutions to the problem were not touched upon. Uh, at least, I, I, if, it, if they were, I missed it. One is increasing energy prices. We should, we all pay, and we, we don't like to pay more for anything, but we all pay much too little for energy in our current uh, society. We pay too little uh, for transportation energy, for electric energy, for heat energy. Uh, the prices of these things would, should be much higher. If they were higher, uh, either uh, the, the money going into uh, production and research of, of more energy or just plain taxes uh, 
would reduce the use of energy. Uh, one, one of the most basic things we know is when you raise the price of something, people use less. You know, we have high cigarette taxes and high liquor taxes, and, and it works to some extent. Okay, the other, the most important way I think of solving the, the crisis of, of pollution and energy is lower population. Uh, but this is difficult politically. Uh, people scream like stuck pigs if you raise the gasoline prices. If you tell them that they can't have babies and as many babies as they want to have, they'll scream even more. So it's a major political problem, but I think it's the ultimate solution. Uh, there are too many people on the planet for the resources that the planet has and can support. Uh, and I'd also like to comment on the Boston Marathon uh, bombing, obviously a tragic incident, and uh, at least the people who did it have, have one is killed and one has been uh, captured. I find this in incident to be more foreboding than many of the other bombings we've seen, because most of the bombings that we've seen either have been in uh, workplaces, including the World Trade Center and the embassies and, and various other places, or schools, not, not good, I'm not saying it's good that they take place in these places, but only one other uh, situation that I can think of, maybe you can remember others, have bombs been set off uh, at major events with large crowds. Uh, and this is very scary because this, this, this could uh, uh, change our lives even more than the, the other types of bombings that we've seen because it's very easy to kill or maim a lot of people all at once in small spaces if you go to football stadiums, uh, parades, and other types of major events where there are a lot of people. The only other one I can think of uh, is 1996 at the Atlanta Olympics where uh, Eric Rudolph set off a bomb there. Uh, so I hope that this is not a, a precursor for things to come. Two comments on how it was handled by authorities. One, one positive, one negative. Positive, the technology is incredible. I mean, they got these guys very, very quickly because of the technology. The technology of the, of the videos and seeing their faces and getting them out and getting the reports very quickly. And on the other hand, you probably heard about the, uh, uh, the helicopter that found this guy in the boat using heat. Uh, the heat profile, so it's incredible the technology you have. Uh, I think that's good. The bad part of it is, as the government frequently does, they used fear to, to control the population. They said, this is so, so bad that we have to close down the city of Boston, we have to close all the stores, all the offices, all the institutions, shut down public transportation because we've got this one crazy guy running around with a gun. Uh, I think that was incredibly bad, it was good for the politicians because they'll say, well, we're concerned about your safety and that's why we did this and the inconvenience to you uh, is not a problem. I think in a case like that where there's a crazy running around, uh, one crazy in a big city, people have the choice. If they want to take the chance to go out and do their business, they can, or if they want to stay home, they can do that too. Thank you. First of all, I take issue with the idea that the setting off of the bombs at the Boston Marathon was an inside job, or that the setting off of the, or the attempt to set off the bomb at Wrigley Field was an inside job. I mean, what does he think the person was who set it off was belonged to that portion of the White Sox fans who are deranged and want to drive the Cubs out to Rosemont? Uh, that's number one. Number two. Uh, I mentioned the Ogallala Aquifer earlier. Uh, that is going to run out of water in 20 years, according to that film on the Dust Bowl that Ken Burns showed a few months ago on public television. Once again, we see the, the tragic and needless uh, misuse of our resources. They're sucking this aquifer dry, and they're sure as hell, once they run out of water, going to cast an envious eye on the Great Lakes. Dick Army, no liberal he, the former House Majority Leader from Texas, paid a visit to the Indiana Dunes National Lake Shores. Um, could we call this conversation outside? No, they couldn't stop. 
Um, one fool at a time, folks. As I was saying, um, the Dick Army, no liberal he, paid a visit to the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore shortly before he left Congress. And his public comment was to the citizens of the, of the area that we should be sure to guard our Great Lakes because there are people who are going to try and steal its water. And I think Mr. Army for once knew what he was talking about. Finally, I have been a participant in Earth Day in one form or another since the first Earth Day celebration in 1970 when I was a freshman at Evanston Township High School. At that time, we were addressed at the big Earth Day assembly that we had by Dr. Roger Charlier, who was a biologist and a big shot at Northeastern at the time. And as Dr. Charlier put it, mankind is not going to end with a blast, blast or a whimper, but with a gasp. Uh, the only thing I wonder about is, have we really learned anything since then? I hope so. The National Geographic Society published a short book in what they call their special publication series called as we live and breathe, the challenge of our environment. I think that's a challenge we're still trying to work on. Thank you. You know, the funny thing about it is, in all this environmental and concerns about oil and fuel and chemical misuse, I frankly agree with Dennis Nelson. We have got a problem that needs to be fixed. And the other thing is, is that people get prosperous when they have power. One of the first things you can do to help industrialize any country is to make sure that there's a reliable source of electric power, which is why China is building nuclear, I mean, which is why China right now is building a lot of coal power plants. As people prosper, the population does go down because it gets a little bit more expensive to raise kids. Instead of being a source of labor on the farm, they have to be educated, clothed, and fed, and that reduces the population. And if you don't believe me, look at the demographic data. One of the largest things that's happening in the, in the 21st century is a shift in population of, of it getting older. And the other thing you have to realize is that you know, I may be a thorough advocate of these thorium power reactors, but it's inevitable that they're going to be developed. And it's also inevitable that the initial research was already done during the 1960s at Oak Ridge. And you don't shine a light on me. I won't shine a light on you. You don't shine that shit on me. I'm shining a light on you. I'm not a shining light on you. He was shining a laser in his eyes. That's not safe. Yeah. If you do that, I call the police again. Try it. You know, probably one of the better energy sources we haven't considered is all the hot air at the college that we have all the time. <laughs> Perhaps maybe we could solve our energy problem by the stuff we generate here half the time. On the side note. No, Tim, it's all gas. <laughs> Natural gas, no doubt, too, right? I wasn't even going to go into that. Tim, you did it. I did. I know. All right. To make it very short and serious, when I look at this uh, alternate power source and some of the things that it can provide, I do know that there's waste products involved. I do know that there's a cost involved in it. And that any power source we use is going to be inherently unclean or produce some form of waste product. You know, what they're talking about, especially the Thorium Energy Alliance, is about the size of a reactor, about the size of this room or whatever to power maybe the city of Chicago. And it's going to be full of radiation, full of byproducts from radioactive materials and other items. But what you don't know is that at the end of the day, a lot of those products can be recycled or burned off. One of the reasons today that our 
nuclear power is so inefficient is only one tenth of the percent of the uranium in the fuel rods is used or burned. And that a lot of the present technology is like using a uh, old mainframe computer to try to do the job of what a Cray computer could do. The nuclear industry hasn't been allowed to innovate in a long time. What I really believe is going to be the future, though, is a mix of everything. You know, it's going to be great that we have the, the alternate power source. It's going to be great that we have the smart grid. But we're still going to need some form of underlying power. And the, here's what I know is going to happen. If we don't develop this in the United States with our own research that we did at Oak Ridge, it's going to be the Chinese or the Indians or some other country that will come up with the breakthrough. <coughs> It's the, the trend for this kind of power is there. And the fundamental reason I believe it's gonna happen is something that Einstein said a long time ago. And that's energy equals to matter times the speed of light squared. You get a lot more bang for your buck when you go nuclear than when you do with some form of chemical or uh, industrial process that just uses a, a chemical bond. And at the rate we need to use energy and develop, you know, certainly I would much rather have a, a small thorium reactor that produces a, a little waste in the form of something that may have to be sequestered for 400 years than the equivalent in coal trains or in, in other environmental destruction. We have to face facts. If we want an energy intensive society, we're going to have to pay a cost. And even now, you know, with the renewables, as great as they are, a lot of times a typical wind turbine will take 12 years to pay back the energy put in from the energy out. A lot of the solar power things, he's mentioning things like rare earths and other things like this. We right now have more thorium as a, all over the world than we'd ever want to use. And as far as, as far as running out, the thorium is a breeder fuel. It's bombarded with free neutrons, and it converts itself down to uranium U-233, which is fissionable. And here's the kicker of all things. The very guy who invented the light water reactor, Alvin Weinberg, went on later in life to decry his very invention and came up with this whole liquid fluoride thorium reactor as an alternate to what's happening. He calls our present nuclear power situation a Faustian bargain. However, I am fast running out of time, and I thank you for listening. Okay. Um, all right. I, um, you know, I, I would have to disagree with some of the things Tim was saying. First of all, the idea that when that when people prosper, the population goes down—that's not true. As a matter of fact. When people prosper, the population goes up because suddenly people have enough resources and money to have more babies. Um, and there's, you know, that doesn't cause the population to go down. Now, what really causes right, Tim? One fool at a time. Now, I'm, I'm going to get to the subject of people interrupting each other in about a minute, okay? But first, I just want to finish saying what I was going to say. Now, um, now, what what really causes the population to go down? Is, uh, is women waiting longer to have children. If, if, if women start having children at, let's say, the age of 14, uh, they could easily have 20 kids by the time they're 35. Now, uh, now, on the other hand, a woman who waits until, let's say, she's 35 may have one, two kids at most. Uh, and, 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 and in countries like the United States or France or Japan, uh, because women are more educated, they wait longer to have kids, mm -hmm. and consequently they have fewer of them. This is the reason why in the advanced industrialized countries, the population growth rate has dropped to zero. And this is the reason why in countries like, let's say, India, the population is still going up. Now, on the subject of China, yeah, China's population is not growing as fast as it was. And the reason for that is because of the draconian population control uh, methods uh, which which the Chinese government is at is is practicing right now in which in which parents uh, have to get permission to have have had to have to get permission to marry no children are allowed uh, unless the couple is married and there's two parents uh, they have to uh, as I understand it right now they have to get authorization to even have one child which they generally get if they ha they're not permitted to have two children 
And if they do, they have to pay a fine. <coughs> Three children can result in having your kids taken away from you. And as a matter of fact, uh, they've actually killed people or killed parents for having a third child. Uh, they're pretty. They're pretty strict in China. Now, on the idea that thorium is inevitable, I'd have to just. I'd have to. Excuse me, Bob. Um, on the idea that thorium is inevitable, I uh, have to disagree because nothing is inevitable except for death and taxes. <laughs> All right. Now, now, finally, I want to get to the subject of bad behavior at the College of Complexes. And I've seen a lot of it here tonight. I see people interrupting other people, and I, I see people talk, you know, and uh, that's, you know, we have a rule. We don't have a whole. This is a freedom of speech forum. We don't have a whole lot of rules here. But one rule we do have is one fool at a time, and that means that you don't interrupt other people. You know, if you don't want to be interrupted or cut off, don't interrupt other people. All right. And uh, and on, and there's something else I would like to say, and that is on the subject of people who feel like three dollars is an outrageously expensive tuition to pay, and. To that, I say, fuck you, you know. So, uh, you know, if you don't want to pay three bucks, um, you know, then go someplace else. Go someplace where they charge ten bucks instead. I mean, more. Where are you going? I thought you were going to sing. No. No. Uh, the oh, only... Uh, for you. <laughs> the only uh, thing that I wanted to comment on uh, was yes. the uh, need for uh, your prayers for the churches that have to sponsor uh, uh, Boy Scouts or, or other uh, uh, such programs, because when the, the when the agencies when the associations that uh, lead those programs uh, discriminate against. Uh, 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 homosexual youth, or uh, the, the Boy Scouts used to discriminate against uh, uh, black youth. They they had to be in separate uh, uh, troops. Uh, uh, I remember a comrade of mine in the Socialist Party uh, who uh, he was a strapper of so and so, but he was also a straight arrow. And he was a member of the Order of the Arrow. Uh, and uh, he had a troop on the south side of Chicago here. Uh, he was uh, a scoutmaster. And uh, he integrated his troop. Uh, they were kicked out of the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, I, 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 but he. He, when he died uh, in the uh, uh, in the eighties, nineteen eighties, I remember that he had uh, a, a funeral in the Order of the Arrow, uh, and I, uh, the uh, the Boy Scouts. Uh, are, are bigger than their uh, their sins. <laughs> so we pray for them all. Uh, and I, I, I ask your prayers for them too. Uh, uh, since uh, there's uh, if there's anything else to be said, I think uh, Nelson will say it. Speaker gets the last word. Okay, how much time do we have left before 11 o'clock? Uh, 45 minutes. You do? It's only 10.15, so you can, you can take it to the amount of time that you need to finish.
Hey, thanks for your comments, everybody. And I'm going to say something, and again, I'm not on anybody's case, but let's respect each other and other people's opinions. I know the College of Complexes is known for its drama. I mean, there's no contrived, I call it contrived reality shows. There's no contrived reality show on commercial TV that, some, that can compete sometimes with what I've seen in real life, particularly here. It's unscripted, live, but let's respect each other and let's like, you know, you know, let's, you know, zero use of the profanity, that sort of thing. Again, to re-emphasize, you know, we'll see on Monday, the real Earth Day uh, for the protest. There's a couple other things that I brought from the um, Chicago Cultural Center. This is from um, Rainforest Action Network Chicago <coughs> to um, Enbridge wants to expand a, a tar sands uh, pipeline with a larger tar sands pipeline and you know, to protect Lake Michigan from Enbridge. And for what it's worth, I did do a comment. It was an action alert from the National Wildlife Federation. I did that today to the U.S. State Department, and the information is right here. This is the information about the moratorium bill. It mentions both the House and Senate uh, numbers about don't frack Illinois. And that's going to be, uh, again, these are the topics, by the way, for Monday's Earth Day event proper, is stop the war on water. Again, Canadian tar sands and um, natural gas and oil fracking here in the land of Lincoln. So I've got some, so please take these and use them. I just want to make sure that, you know, people know that these two are there. I've got some other more flyers for the uh, protest. Again, I thank everybody for their comments. And start off with Frank. I agree we need to understand natural cycles. Uh, Frank mentioned the hydrologic cycle and didn't mention it by name, but the nutrient cycle. These are free ecosystem services, so called free, because we don't have to pay a dime for them. Unfortunately, well, we're, we, it seems like we're doing our best to uh, s destroy, simplify, fragment ecosystems which are actually the, nat the natural life support systems of, of, our, of our planet. Uh, Frank uh, brings up using irrigation uh, for uh, desert regions or marginal areas again and he spoke to me uh, earlier uh, about this. Okay, talk about bomb threats and detonations. Um, Boston Marathon isn't really an Earth Day environmental issue but it's tragic that it happened. And it could have happened at Chicago Marathon, for what it's worth. I mean, you think about it, the finish line at the Chicago Marathon, because I wasn't a runner, but I was there for, um, it was a, a, a protest, and you can imagine, you know, the same situation happening here. I'm just putting it out. The point I'm making is we live in a real world where we have real terrorists and people with their own crazy agendas. Again, uh, John McPhee wrote a book, The Curve of Binding Energy, a long time ago that, um, that uh, spotlighted on a nuclear physicist and, um, and, and bomb creator, uh, Dr. Theodore Taylor, a physicist who came and said that you could you know, make, take plutonium and make a bomb the size of a grapefruit, and he used the World Trade Center uh, that we could topple the World Trade Center. Again, but you don't even need to make a fission bomb. You can make what's called a dirty bomb. You take nuclear material, pack it with plastic explosives. <coughs> Again, um, we're running out. Yeah, we are running out of uranium. We have a limited supply. That's why the pro-nuclear cheerleaders are promoting the various types of what are called the breeder reactors: the thorium cycle, the light water cycle, plutonium cycle. And you're all talking about you know more wastes and, and bomb materials. Um, there's no uh, nuclear technology that's uh, proliferation proof. Uh, we again agree that we don't need natural gas as a transition bridge. Um, thermonuclear fusion was brought up and it was brought up in the rebuttal and I'm going into it now because I usually get my fusion question which I, I, I kind of anticipate and I didn't get it during the question and answer session but in this, it's mentioned in the rebuttal so I'll, I'll discuss it now. I used to support thermonuclear fusion as at least one thing that should be considered as an alternative to nuclear power. I was a senior in high school in 1972. 
senior social problems, we had an ecology unit, and the students taught the unit, and so mine was how peaceful the peaceful atom, not very. I had just uh, heard, um, it was uh, for environmental action that fall, uh, Dr. John Goffman, now fortunately passed away, medical physicist and one of the original nuclear whistleblowers to make a me mechanical engineer from the University of California, University of Minnesota, University of Minnesota. He said, I'm very conservative toward life. I don't think we should take any unnecessary chances like nuclear power. Nuclear power should be turned off. And that was the basic message. I mentioned uh, the Goffman Tamplin radiation thing, which I could get into. Uh, challenging the population guideline standards that the then Atomic Energy Commission supported, talking about increases in cancer, leukemia, and genetic damage if the number of reactors were built, which achieved, I think it's 170 millirems and, or millirads. And, um, and I mentioned three alternatives, solar, conservation, and fusion. Now remember, this is 1972. I'm a kid, science-minded kid, reading all this stuff, and people thought I promoted solar because, well, I preferred solar because that was the, happened to be the first one. I do. I support conservation, of course, conservation efficiency, and fusion was considered an option back then. Now I should say, and I say we just really should forget it. We really don't need it. Um, it'll create mat mat technology and materials that can be used for weapons, and again, there's dirty fusion, which will create uh, tritium, which is radioactive heavy water that could get into the food chain. And, but even if, you know, with what uh, Obama's science and technology chief advisor, Dr. John Holdren, he's a mechanical engineer and plasma physicist by training, one of the smartest environmental scientists around, in fact, one of Paul Ehrlich's students at Stanford University in California. Clean fusion, if we want to wait for it, but still, uh, I mean, we're talking about cheap, abundant energy. Now, I'm for energy to be used wisely, to be used affordable, but do we really need cheap, abundant energy? Would we really have the discipline to use it wisely? Uh, biologist Paul Ehrlich said in the 70s that, again, uh, giving society cheap, abundant energy at that point, and I still agree at this point, would be the moral equivalent of giving an idiot child a machine gun because every attempt would be made to basically overexploit, overpay the planet, and further you know, decimate our uh, fresh water supplies that have been mentioned, and the ecosystem services that uh, Frank, uh, that Frank uh, talked about. Um, agree with the gentleman from the Sierra Club, we definitely do, I do support the uh, money going into um, to wind power. Um, we don't depend upon foreign countries for wind. I don't know where this physicist is, where his assumptions are. Uh, North and South Dakota or the Saudi Arabia wind alone, when you're looking at the 14 to 16 states that make up the middle, Midwest, from Minnesota down to Texas, uh, we, we've got, uh, you know, including here in Illinois, we've got more than enough uh, wind, wind capacity. Uh, and, and, and Texas has been really out there uh, promoting uh, wind, wind, po wind power as well. Um, increasing energy prices deliberately in order to encourage less use is really a sticky wicket. Uh, there are gas taxes overseas in Europe. That's why the prices of the pump are so high. Again, he's no longer in office, but our former U.S. Energy Secretary, Stephen <coughs> Chu, was called on the carpet by certain Republicans where, I guess, previous during the campaign, he had advocated uh, higher gas prices, putting a tax on gasoline in order to encourage uh, less consumption. And of course, with voters screaming, two things that voters don't like, you know, higher taxes, higher gas prices, among other things. And he had to backtrack, because with gas prices over $4 a gallon here in Chicago, for example, among the highest and not the highest in the nation, uh, now he's no longer there, but former Secretary Chu had to say, well, I don't support uh, you know, raising the price of gas right now. I don't, I've changed my mind on that. Mm -hmm. And again, even you know, if you use, let's say, the tax as a rebate or a refund 
for lower and fixed income people to help them out. It's really a sticking wicket because these things have been proposed in the past, but again, through, given the political uh, climate, we talk about climate, we've got the uh, you know, natural climate, then we have also the uh, political climate in Congress that it's going to be uh, extremely impossible and virtually impossible if not existent to pass. With challenges come opportunities. There are opportunities for activists like myself, opportunities for everybody in this room. There are three opportunities at the table. Please take the information. Opportunities for businesses to make profits and create jobs and save the environment at, at the same time. Um, Dr. Arjun Makajani is the architect of Carbon Free Nuclear Free, and he is in his report has outlined a 100% renewable energy grid containing all the neat stuff. You know, that's solar, wind, tidal, combined heat and power, all this and that. He's got the percentages, and they all add up to 100%. So we really don't need any, you know, coal, nuclear plants, anything like that. We don't, I don't, I don't buy uh, President Obama's all the above philosophy. Uh, we don't have to do everything, and we shouldn't do everything. Uh, 400 years to safeguard rad waste, uh, that, that sounds like something out of uh, the late uh, pro-nuclear cheerleader, Dr. Uh, Edward Teller's book. You're, you're talking about time frames of hundreds of thousands of years. 250,000 years up to you know 500,000 years when you consider the half-lives of certain uh, radionucleotides like uh, like plutonium. Uh, population stabilization, I agree, should be humanely done as much as possible. Um, I agree that a thorium fuel cycle is not inevitable. Uh, again, as I said before, like the Keystone XL is not inevitable. Um, far as um, the three dollar admission I think is um, it's affordable under the circumstances. Uh, I'm glad I don't have to pay it being the guest speaker and I always enjoy the, the free dinner being uh, you know, counted. The Center for Green Technology, I've attended programs in the past just for an interest sake. They're on North Sacramento. They used to have a lot of free workshops and seminars I used to go to and now because of cash they're charging ten dollars a pop for each program. Which makes you kind of think, you know, which ones do you really want to go to, which ones not? Because the $10 figure was mentioned, do we really want to pay $10 tuition? I think that's a bit too high. Let's leave it at three here at the college. But the Center for Green Technology, if you want to go to one of their things, now it's you know it's it's, it's $10 a pop, and it used to be uh, all free. Um, the Boy Scouts of America, their board is meeting in May. And the subject of allowing uh, gay scouts is supposed to be uh, discussed at, at that time. Uh, got some time left. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, because of finances and everything, I didn't get a chance to uh, hear uh, last week's uh, presentation on North Korea. I really would like to have been there. Um, there was a book that came out in the 80s, The First Nuclear World War. Two of the co-authors were Amory and Hunter Lovings, which are names that should be familiar with uh, at least some of you. And it described a scenario that a nuclear, that the next nu and the nuclear conflict would not really be a exchange between the U.S. and Soviet, per se, but a regional conflict that would get out of control, and that's precisely the situation that hopefully will not happen. And I did a review of this book I don't know if the Heartland Journal is still publishing from the Heartland Cafe, but it was a book review that, that I did. Now I get to tell my Dennis Rodman story. I actually met the worm, and this was uh, within a week before he went to North Korea. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to really talk with him about it. I was at the bar area of a restaurant that I usually frequent. It was a Friday night. Um, I met some people at regulars I hadn't seen for a while, just... Um, you know, um, kicking back, it's free, um, free, unlimited refills of soda, and I like Mountain Dew, we, for we all have our vices for the sugar and caffeine. And uh, then in comes Mr. Rodman with a couple of his friends, uh, a lady and, and a guy, and the guy, we'll get to in a minute, was basically, was, basically was half in the bag. 
you know, but, and sat down at the table, and, um, and uh, so he stopped one guy walking backwards because the tables are like this. He's walking the aisle, and he you know, talks with him. He's out you know, having a good time. So limited refills of soda, and then I drink and drink and drink. Then, quite frankly, I start peeing like a racehorse. So I've got to head for the for the men's room, and I'm strutting real fast. And Rodman grabs my arm, turns to goes, asks me, and I swear this is true. Goes, no prejudice of God. Asks me, are you Jewish? And I said, no. It's because if I'm, it's just it's Dennis Rodman being Dennis Rodman, and I know that. And if he wants to play with me, he's picked the right guy to do that on a Friday night. So I say no. Uh, because I just really, you know, I said what I did, be laughing, and I don't look Jewish, blah, blah, blah. And this guy that was with him, this, this wasted guy, was really obnoxious. I really didn't have a chance to discuss with Rodman further. And uh, are you, why are you dishing on me? And I said, well, I'm not dishing on you. Um, you know, he's the one who got my attention. And then I left, and I, you know, go rock on. And this, that's, the, that's the rock on sign. So I said, rock on, and just left. I disengaged. And he, this drunk guy also blocked two other guys who wanted to come to the table to meet Rodman. And, oh, there, he's blocking us. My point is, if I would have asked him about his projects, I would have got a head up on, oh, I'm heading to North Korea to meet. And the nickname's the, the ruler's Little Kim. I call him Little Kim because that's his nickname. And it would have been interesting in order to have an exchange, in order to tell, you know, to, to find out what's going on. Uh, because of uh, you know knowing politics and everything, so that's why I kind of have a zero tolerance for hecklers and that sort of thing. But uh, and, and within a week later, you know Dennis Rodman was smiling with little Kim at a basketball game and having a good time, and he's an NBA uh, fan and everything when he was in the states. But um, that, that's um, that, that again, you're getting back to it. You know, the, we, we need to you know reduce the tensions and. So things don't don't escalate out of control there. I mean, little Cam is shooting his mouth off, and people know that there may not be probably it's not going to be a nuclear missile that's going to reach our shores, but it could reach uh, you know South Korea, which is an ally of ours, and also a, a U.S. military base, you know, in in the South Pacific. So I just thought I'd um, throw out um, 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 Dennis Rodman, my meeting uh, Dennis Dennis Rodman story. I want to mention about fracking that there are 1,500 sites reserved already for fracking activities. Uh, near Starved Rock State Park, they want to uh, mine the sand particulate for, for use in fracking. Again, environmentalists uh, want it to happen with more strict regulations, and that compromise, again, has a bad smell to it. And the two-year moratorium on fracking followed by the ban is, you know, what, 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 I, what I support. Um, saw something online from uh, Climate Progress, that's Joseph Brown's climate blog from the Center for American Progress from April 5th of this year that, um, of course, everyone knows Roger Ebert, who was the first film critic to win a Pulitzer Prize, died on April 4th of this year from cancer at the age of 70. Uh, Robert had, Ebert had strong progressive views. Shortly before his death, Ebert posted a piece about climate disruption. New seasons with new names, and a short ex excerpt, quote, I have watched with a kind of petrified fascination in recent years as the world creeps closer to what looks to me like disastrous climate change, uh, un unquote. And I'm gonna, not going to talk until 11 o'clock, but I just wanted to give some updates on the uh, Fukushima nuclear disaster, because it's... Um, that the, the, uh, the, the, the second anniversary was uh, the beginning it was March um, was March 11th. And there's a water there's seven in ground water storage ponds that contain highly contaminated wastewater and they're leaking radioactive beta water. Beta is a radiation particle leaking into the surrounding soil. And on April 2nd, Tokyo General Electric. The Tokyo Electric Company, not GE, Tokyo Electric Company, or TEPCO, finally came out uh, the previous Friday and said that it deserves a majority of the blame for the Fukushima nuclear disaster. The president said, our, quote, 
Our safety culture, skills, and ability were all insufficient, unquote. And that's, that's an understatement as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for their um, participation today and um, this um, College of Complex uh, for um, Earth Day is adjourned. Let's thank our speaker again with a little more applause. Thank <laughs> you.